A viral claim is going around that Lake Oroville rose 23 feet overnight. No rain, no storm, no upstream releases, no explanation. Just a reservoir levitating in the dark. And I get why that hook works, because if it were real, it wouldn't be a curiosity. It would be a full-blown emergency. Oroville isn't some random lake with a dock and a gift shop. It's one of the biggest pressure points in California's entire water system. And when Oroville moves quickly, people notice, not just because of what the water might do, but because of what history has already proven can happen when the situation gets out of balance. But here's the problem. The 23 feet overnight with no rain framing isn't grounded, not even close. The real story is still dramatic, still worth watching, and honestly more important than internet horror bait. But it's dramatic in the way geology and hydrology usually are. A chain reaction of storm-fed inflows, fast rising storage, flood control rules that force operators to act early, and a reservoir sitting in a steep Sierra watershed that can go from calm to aggressive in a matter of days. If you want to understand what's actually happening at Lake Oroville right now and why it matters, you have to start with the data, not the adrenaline. So let's anchor this to reality. Here's what the official updates show. Lake Oroville was around 826 feet on January 2nd, 2026, about 834 feet by January 5th, and around 844 feet by the data cutoff late on January 8th, posted January 9th. That's a clear rise over the first week of January. Real movement, measurable, not subtle. And even more important than the early January numbers is the broader context DWR, shared. Between December 20th and January 4th, Oroville rose about 67 feet. That's the holy f number. That's the true scale of how hard the system can move when the watershed turns on and a series of winter storms starts feeding the reservoir. And it wasn't hidden and it wasn't mysterious. It was exactly what you'd expect when Northern California gets hit with a strong storm sequence and the Feather River drainage starts funneling water into storage. Now, here's where the narrative gets interesting and where a geology channel can actually cook without lying. Because the real story isn't how did the lake rise, the real story is what happens after the lake rises when operators have to start treating the reservoir like a live pressure vessel with strict rules. On January 5th, the Department of Water Resources announced that it began required flood control releases using Oroville Dam's main spillway. That's the moment the situation shifts. Because a rising lake is normal during wet periods. But the transition into spillway releases is where the balance becomes fragile where decisions get time sensitive and where the system stops being a passive container and starts acting like a controlled machine. And at Orville, the word spillway is never just a word, it's a trigger. You don't even have to explain 2017 in detail for people to feel it, but we're going to, because this is the psychological fault line running underneath every Oroville story. In February 2017, heavy inflows pushed Oroville toward capacity. Spillway flows began, damage formed, erosion became a crisis, and the situation escalated into an evacuation affecting around 188,000 people downstream. That event carved a memory into Northern California that doesn't fade. When the public hears Oroville plus spillway plus rising water, their nervous system doesn't wait for a technical briefing. It jumps straight to the lived footage, sirens, traffic, midnight anxiety, families grabbing what they can, and that feeling of, if this dam fails, there is no second chance. That's why misinformation spreads so easily here, because it's not being planted into an empty audience, it's being planted into a community already primed by trauma. We're not doing fantasy, we're doing reality. Then, you pivot into the real physics of why reservoirs rise fast, why the lake can jump week to week even if it doesn't jump overnight, and why the timeline matters more than any single dramatic sentence. Because what you're actually watching at Oroville isn't a mystery event. You're watching a system respond to pressure. Let's break down the mechanics because this is where the geology and hydrology become the real main character. A reservoir doesn't rise because it's raining on the lake. 
It rises because it's raining or melting across the entire watershed feeding it. Oroville's watershed is essentially an enormous funnel. It takes precipitation spread across mountains and valleys and converts it into runoff that concentrates into river channels. And when the ground gets saturated and the storms arrive back to back, the runoff response accelerates. The watershed stops absorbing water and starts shedding it. The rivers stop rising gradually and start pushing volume. That's why it's completely possible for a reservoir to rise quickly, even when the sky above the dam looks calm. You can be standing at Auroville under quiet weather, while the watershed upstream is actively delivering storage like a conveyor belt. And then comes the second piece that makes Auroville dangerous in a unique way. Flood control rules. Auroville is not just fill it and chill. Between fall and spring, the reservoir is operated under a flood control diagram, meaning a portion of its storage space has to remain available to capture future runoff so downstream communities aren't slammed by uncontrolled releases. In other words, operators have to think ahead. Not what is happening today, but what is arriving next, because if a new storm shows up while the reservoir is already too high, your options collapse. You either release water aggressively into a river system that may already be stressed, or you risk losing your buffer entirely. Flood control space is like oxygen in a fire. You don't notice it until you're out of it. That's why early releases happen. And this is important. Releases aren't automatically a sign of failure. They're a sign of the system doing what it was designed to do. The scary part isn't the existence of releases. The scary part is when the required releases collide with downstream limitations, ecosystem impacts, infrastructure concerns, and public trust. Oroville sits in the middle of all of that. Now, let's take it one level deeper, into the geology angle most people never talk about. A reservoir isn't just water sitting in a bowl. It's water interacting with rock, soil, sediment, slope stability, and engineered structures anchored into the earth. When the water level rises fast, you change the stress distribution on the reservoir banks. You saturate materials that were dry. You load slopes that were previously stable. You can destabilize weak points, trigger small slides, undercut shorelines, and mobilize sediment. None of this is exotic. It's classic reservoir geomorphology. The dramatic part is the speed. Slow changes allow the system to adjust, fast changes shock it. And there's another subtle geology effect people don't realize. When you load a reservoir with a huge volume of water quickly, you're adding weight. That added water mass changes stress conditions in the crust locally. In some settings, this can slightly influence seismicity, not as in the dam causes an earthquake, but as in mass loading can modulate tiny fault stresses. This isn't a TikTok conspiracy. It's a known geophysical concept, but the key is scale. It's subtle, it's not Hollywood, and it's not going to create a magical 23-foot rise. What it does do is remind you that water is not passive. Water is a force that reshapes landscapes and interacts with geology in ways people only notice when it's already moving. So if you want the mystery feel without lying, you frame the mystery correctly. The mystery isn't, where did the water come from? The mystery is, how fast can the watershed turn on, how quickly can the reservoir climb, and what does the system have to do to stay ahead of the next storm sequence? That's the real suspense. That's what makes a reservoir story genuinely intense. The moment the lake rises fast, engineers don't panic. They start eliminating causes and verifying signals. They cross-check instrumentation, compare telemetry with manual readings, confirm inflow and outflow records, and check forecasts. They compare the lake's elevation curve against expected runoff behavior. They watch the river stage downstream. They monitor spillway discharge behavior. They watch for seepage patterns, turbidity, piezometric readings, and deformation signals. Because the real catastrophic dam failures in history almost always had a quiet phase first, where the warning signs were present but either dismissed or not communicated fast enough. So what would actually be alarming at Oroville? Not, the lake is rising. The lake rising in winter is expected. The alarming signals are the ones that suggest loss of control or unusual behavior in the structure or the surrounding ground. A real red flag is a sustained rise into critical operating zones that reduce flexibility. 
Another is an unexpected change in seepage behavior, where drain flows become turbid or increase in a pattern inconsistent with normal loading. Another is instrumentation anomalies that don't resolve with redundancy checks. Another is spillway performance issues under elevated flow, anything that suggests the system cannot safely pass the volumes it might need to pass if storms stack again. And the biggest driver of risk isn't any one number. It's storm stacking. One storm fills, the next storm forces releases, the third storm compresses the whole system into a narrow window of safe options. This is why the viral 23 feet overnight narrative is actually harmful. It trains viewers to look for the wrong signals. It encourages them to distrust real updates because they've been taught the truth should sound like a horror story. But the truth at Oroville is almost scarier because it's real and it's repeatable. In a wet pattern, Oroville can rise quickly over days and weeks, and operators have to run the system proactively to keep flood control space available. That means the public might see spillway use even when things are functioning correctly. And because of 2017, the public might interpret that as the start of another disaster. That gap between engineering reality and public perception is its own hazard. Misinformation fills that gap instantly. You can treat Oroville like a living geological system, not just a piece of concrete. The dam is infrastructure, yes, but the real engine is the watershed. Oroville is fed by a huge network of terrain and drainage patterns that respond to storms. The lake is the scoreboard, but the game is upstream. When atmospheric rivers or strong winter systems hit Northern California, you're watching the Sierra Nevada convert weather into runoff. And that conversion depends on temperature, snow line, ground saturation, and storm pacing. A warm storm can melt snow and amplify runoff. A saturated basin sheds faster. Back-to-back -back storms reduce recovery time and build momentum. This is why the same amount of precipitation can have very different outcomes depending on timing. That's hydrology as suspense. So let's create a clean narrative arc that holds attention without lying. The hook is the rumor. The pivot is the data. The escalation is the real rise and the spillway releases. The tension is the memory of 2017 plus the reality of flood control rules. The geology twist is how fast watersheds respond and how rapid loading affects slopes, sediment, and downstream systems. Then, the cliffhanger is the only cliffhanger that matters, what happens if storms keep stacking. And in this story, you don't need to invent deep geothermal water signatures or rare earth elements or aquifer intrusion. That kind of fake detail is tempting because it sounds scientific, but it's a credibility grenade. The audience you're building, the older, documentary, serious vibe, will eventually detect that and disengage. You can be more powerful by being more real. Your detail comes from explaining how watersheds behave, how flood control diagrams force decisions, how inflow versus outflow balance determines whether levels rise or stabilize, and why the spillway is both normal and psychologically explosive at Oroville. Now let's zoom out and show why Oroville isn't just a local story. Oroville is tied into California's broader water strategy, and when it rises, it affects allocations, planning, energy generation, and downstream habitat. Releases can increase turbidity, alter river conditions, and stress ecosystems that are adapted to certain flow ranges. Rapid reservoir rises can mobilize shoreline sediment and reshape nearshore zones. And on the human side, you're dealing with communities that still remember being told to leave. That memory changes behavior. People prepare earlier. They distrust reassurances. They watch the lake like it's a threat. That's not irrational. That's an adaptation to living near high consequences. So here's the moment you end with your signature quiet intensity ending. Lake Oroville is rising fast, but not mysteriously. The official level moved from roughly 826 feet to 834 feet to 844 feet across early January. DWR reported that the lake jumped about 67 feet between December 20th and January 4th and that flood control releases via the main spillway began on January 5th. That's the real story. 
The lake is rising because the watershed is feeding it, and the system is responding to make space for what might come next. The question isn't whether the lake is rising. The question is how the system handles the next storm sequence, how quickly it can create buffer space without stressing the river downstream, and whether the public can trust the process enough to stay calm when the numbers move. Because in California, you don't need a conspiracy for things to get dangerous. All you need is momentum, a wet pattern, a saturated basin, a fast climb, a forecast that won't stop, and a reservoir with a history that makes every decision feel like a countdown. If you want grounded coverage of real geological and natural hazard events, without the fake panic, without the clickbait science, subscribe. And if you're anywhere near the Feather River system, tell us what you're seeing on the ground, because a reservoir tells one story with numbers, but the landscape downstream tells the rest.